Shalom and welcome to this week's edition of Free Hebrew Class. We are so excited that you have decided to join us today. Now, we sent out a post earlier to uh, invite everyone to attend today's class. Today's class is going to be just a little bit more intense than some of the other classes. If you've taken your time to print out the materials, you'll see that we got nine pages of our handout to cover. So we're going to be covering that and uh, in greater detail today. But before we begin, we wanted to send out our prayers to one of our students. She's been a longtime student here at the Hebrew classes. Her name is Miss Vera, and we want to pray for her because she's got some serious health conditions that have surfaced. But we all believe by the power of the Holy Spirit that God can perfect everything that concerns her. So we are lifting up our prayers to Yeshua this day on her behalf as uh, believers in Yeshua, and we believe that he will perfect that which concerns her from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. We are speaking total healing, total health, and total restoration for Miss Vera today and any of those that are in need of healing this day. So we want to um, give you a moment to go ahead and print your materials so that you can be ready to follow along with the class. If you look down in the Facebook post yesterday, you'll be able to see all of the materials for today's class. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you for tuning in. Please stand and uh, bless the Talib. Baruch Atah Adonai, Elohim, and Malachi Olam, Asher Kedeshana, B'Mitzvah, Fah, B'Mitzvah, and Malachi, Gat, Day, Fah, Shikshi. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kavod, Mahuto, Le'olam Ba'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's do the uh, Avinu prayer. <coughs> and I'll get it out. <coughs> Follow along. We're going to have a pretty intense uh, lesson today. As Juan has already, you did state that already, didn't yes, you? Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Avinu Shabbat Shamayim Yit Kodesh. Shimka Vait Barek Malkutka Retsoneka Iehe Asui Bashamayim Uva Ares Vatitain Lachmenu Timi di Eat Unko Lanu Kato Tenu Kaasher Anachnu Mokalim Lachotiim Lanu Vea Tevi Enu, Lidei Nisayan, Vasha Marenu, Mikol Ra, Amin. Our Father in heaven, may your name be sanctified. May your kingdom be blessed. Your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. Give us our bread daily. Forgive us the debt of our sins as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the hands of a test and protect us from all evil. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. <clears throat> We're going to get started. I want us to, uh, before we get started, I, wa I want to have you not concentrate or not try to concentrate as much as we go through the lesson because I'm going to go quickly. You're not going to have time to really absorb what I'm going to present to you this morning. So as I go through it, that will give you a, an introduction, if, if you will, on this lesson so that you can take it home and read it and digest, you on the, on the internet or Facebook, whatever you are, the things that uh, that Wanda sent out 
to you is identical to what we're going to uh, to be studying today. I don't want to be redundant, but take that and and digest it because there's so much here and it's so much richness. So let's let's proceed. And Father, I pray right now that everybody that is online, everybody that's following this, that you give them, Father, the mind of Christ to absorb what we are presenting. Because it's all about you, Yeshua. All about you. Welcome back to our study on the Talit. We will call this lesson Talit Gimel. It's the third lesson, Aleph Bet Gimel. I might add that we will have our last lesson on the Talit and the last lesson of our Hebrew studies next week, and it will be Talit Dalet. But for this time, we're going to enjoy what we're going on. When I wear the Talit, or prayer shawl, it's in loving obedience to God's instruction to wear the four-cornered cloak bearing the special tassels. The tallit is not a tallit unless it has the special tass uh, tassels connected to its four corners. So if you don't have the tzitzits on here, it's just a garment, just like putting on a jacket. Once the tzitzits are put on there, it makes it holy, as we're going to get into it. In modern times, it might be likened to a sweatshirt or a stadium jacket, where the importance lies not in the actual piece of the clothing, but listen to this, but in the slogan or the school emblem it carries. So when you are wearing a school jacket and you're somewhere in, uh, you're going to a baseball game and they see so-and-so, they're looking at the emblem. Well, how did they see the emblem? It's because it was on a garment of some kind. So the garment was not important, but it was what the garment what was placed on the garment to identify you of where you went to school, okay? The Talit comes in many colors. You can choose according to your own personality. Isn't that awesome? God says, you can be yourself, but make sure the tassel, the tzitzit seats are connected. So. Every lesson that I've taught, I've worn a different tallit and a uh, different colored tallit. But the tassels, the tzitzits, were there. The tallit is never taken into a restroom. Why? Because it's holy. It is always to be placed in a special bag, usually made of velvet. And I have velvet bags. Velvet. Normally when you buy a tallit, they will offer you a bag and a kippa. So you can have a, the same design, if you will. And if you do not request, obviously they're just going to send you the tallit. When you get your tallit, take it to a rabbi and have them bless it. Messianic rabbi. Have them bless it. And I'm going to get a lot of feedback, probably say, well, why a Messianic rabbi? Well, we believe in Yeshua. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeshua is our king, our Lord. Even though he's not really king yet, the book of Revelation says he will be king when he comes back, but in our hearts, we are uh, he is our king. Morning, Gail. Afternoon, really. <laughs> it's always good to see Gail. <laughs> so anyway, made in bell. Let's review this prayer once again. The tzitzit is attached to the tali, uh, uh, to, to the uh, yeah, tali, which particular knots and wrappings are there. In rabbinical Judaism, the number of strands Knots and spirals within each tzitzit is given an interpretation. We're going to get deeply into that. 
So let me show you first a prayer again, and let's explain about the knots and the strands. Here is the prayer that is on the Atara. Remember we taught on the Atara last week. The Atara is, is, uh, is right across. It's called the crown or the diadem. And in this one, it's, it's Baruch Atah, uh, Elohim, Malek Olam, Asher, Kedeshana, Bavitzotah, Vitzivano, Lehitate, Ba, Tzitzit. And here it is here in Hebrew. Okay, there it is, right there. You can save this, and when you get your Talit, if you decide that you want to get one, make sure that the prayer is on there, and then before you put the Talit on, you will say the prayer as we do at every lesson. And there it is, all in Hebrew. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu and by the way, the two years stand for God, Adonai Eloheinu. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu the blue thread, the longest of the eight. Here's your blue thread. It's on here. Blue thread. It's called the Shemesh, meaning servant. Shemesh. Shemesh, meaning servant. Now, isn't that awesome? We have a sheen, and we have a mem, and we have another sheen. Sheen represents the heart of God. I didn't plan on saying this, but the sheen represents the heart of God. The mem is the word of God, and the other part of the sheen is destroy teeth so we have as a servant the heart of God displaying the word of God destroying the enemy I want you to digest that just for a little bit that is called a servant isn't that what Yeshua came to be a servant he brought the heart of God to us through his devour, his word, to destroy the enemy. That's good. I should sell that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that just came to my mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it's wrapped around the other strands. The blue thread is wrapped around the other strands. We're going to get into that. There are five double knots above each of the four wrapped strands. There are five, but remember everything is symbolic. There are five books of the Torah. There are five double knots. Torah representing the Word of God. Then you have the first winding of seven turns. And if you look at your, at your tzitzit, you're going to see five turns, uh, uh, on the seven turns on the, uh, on the first knot. Uh, some turns are on the Shemesh or on the seven strands. Seven meaning completion, which means it is finished. Okay? I know I'm going to go fast, but read and absorb because this is, this is the nucleus. This is the climatic feature of our whole teaching of the entire years that we've been studying Hebrew. This is the most important part of the lesson. Then we have the second double knot. Got two knots. There's one knot, two knots, and another winding of eight. So you got a winding of eight around. The number eight, as we know, is a new beginning. If you add these two numbers, seven, yeah, should have been TWO, did it? Two numbers, seven plus eight, we get the number 15 which is the equivalent to the value of the first two letters of God's name. The Hebraic letters Yud with a value of 10 and He, the value of 5. 
Remember yud hey vav hey, okay? Mm -hmm. Then we have a third double knot with 11 windings, which are the last two letters of God's name, vav, which is a six, or represents six, which is man, hey, which means the uh, breath of God, the Holy Spirit, that equals five, that adds up to 11. So, if you add up the first two letters, 15, and the last two letters, 11, you come up with the number 26. And 26 is the holy name of God. yud heh vav heh 10, 5, 6, 5, Yahweh. When you have the fourth knot, then you have the fourth knot, okay? One, two, three, four. And 13 more windings with the final fifth double knot. 13 is equivalent to the word echad. Echad is one. There we go. Ech, ha, aleph, chet, dalet. Aleph is one, chet, eight, dalet, four. That totals 13. The word echad means one or unity. So if we add up all the numbers in total, we have 15, 11, 13, we arrive at 39. Whoa, whoa. Yeshua took 40 lashes less one. In the Hebrew, in the Roman culture, if you, if you whipped somebody 40 times, they died. That was the 40th one. The, four, the last one would put you under. And if the Roman soldier did the 40th, he got whipped 40 times and he died because the body could only take up to 39 max. So he took on 39 stripes. Twenty-six on his back. Thirteen on his chest. And that oh, there's a total of 39 categories that sickness fall into. Any kind of a sickness you have is going to fall into one of the 39 categories of sickness. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. God is our creator. He's our healer. He knows everything. He, he created everything. And he wants us to draw near to him. How does he do that? Through the Hebraic language, all of the symbolisms, all of the numeric value all fits in so tightly. So now when you read the word of God, you're not only hitting the Peshat, the Peshat, which is the first level, or Logos, the first level. But you're going down deeper into the into the Ramez. And that's going to draw you down into the Darash. And you're going to be just walking around in seventh heaven saying, I don't know a thing about God. This is so awesome. Why? You thought you knew something until you start studying. And the moment you got happy, the more skipping a step you had, the more confidence you had in Christ, the more confidence you had that he's got your back. That gives you the more confidence to go after your vision because God is God and you are part because he made you and he is taking care of you. He's watching you. How do we all know this? Because when we go to Hebrew, we can see all of the construction that is for our behalf to get back to him because he's a jealous God. He wants us back. 39 categories. Therefore, from the orthodox point of view, to look at the tzitzis is to remember yud heh vav heh and echad. And we just said the Shema. That's exactly what the Shema said. The Lord is one. Now, so we now have a picture of the name of God, the word of God, the living of God, 
Now when we hold onto the tzitzit, you are holding on to the covenant and promises about God. That's why this is so important. El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, El Elyon, and I'm not going to go through all these because you can read these, but you see all of the, look at all the names of God. Look at all that. Everything that we need is here. Everything. If we take the values of each letter of the word Titsi, we get on the, what is this letter here? I. Zadi? Zadi. 90? Yud? 10? Zadi? Another 90? Yud? Another Yud? 10? Tav? 400. That equals 600. Add the eight strand windings and the five double knots and you get 613. Somebody needs to jump up and say hallelujah. Hallelujah, 613. That's there are also 613 strands around the tallit. Let's read on uh, Matthew. Uh, six, six. But when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father in, in secret, and your Father sees in secret where you pray. When you go in and you go into your closet, this is your closet. This is it. You and God, all by yourself. And God will speak to you because there is no outside hindrance to keep you from the small, still voice. Amen? Amen. When we need God, we go into our closet. When we don't need God, we better get into our closet. <laughs> There are five double knots and four windings that all equal to the number nine. These are the nine gifts of the Ruach Kodesh. From the Messianic point, the Shemesh, the blue thread, points to Yeshua, the suffering servant. He is also the king, as the color blue indicates. Here is the plainer explanation of the Lord is one. Yud, ten, all the way on down. I'm not going to repeat all this because you can, you can read this on your notes. All right? Here's the breakdown of the tzitzi. Knot number one, seven windings. Knot number two, eight windings. Number three, eleven, and all the way on down. Okay? You got all that on your notes. To begin discovering the origin of the tallit, we must start with God's commandments to wear fringes or tzitzits or tassels, literally great things, on the corners of our garments. There are two passages which command us to wear fringes or tassels. Numbers 15, 37 to 45, uh, 41. The Lord also spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak, speak, speak. To the sons of Israel and say and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generation which means it's not going to ever stop and that they shall put on the tassels on each corner of corner of blue or blue thread and it shall be a tassel for you to look on and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your eyes, we're going to get deeper into this in a bit, uh, your own eyes, after which you played the harlot. Numbers 15, 40, in order that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt to your God to be your God, and I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm going to stop right there. How many of us have been brought out of the land of Egypt? Every one of us. Yes. 
We were deep in the land of Egypt. But God brought us out into a newness of life. Thank God for that. Amen. I'd be a dead man by now if that did not happen. I'll tell you that. Anybody knew my testimony. I'd be a dead man. Wanda, you'd be a dead girl. Oh, yes. I'm not going to say anything about cousin. <laughs> Deuteronomy 22 says, You shall not wear a material mixture of wool and linen. We've studied this before. You shall make yourself tails on the four corners of your garment with which you cover yourself. Cover means keep up. Keep up means pitch. And that's another... I always want to go on rabbit trails. As I stated before, when boys reach age of 13, they are bar mitzvah, son, bar, son of commandments. They are always reminded from then on that God is always with them and they are not to commit sexual sin. That's when boys 13, they start thinking about stuff. Uh, are not committing sexual sin or other sins of that nature. They must be pure in the front of God until marriage. Any of us that have been boys, us men, we know about that kind of stuff. Any of you women that have been raising boys, you should know about that kind of stuff. And in the Jewishness, when the boy, now a man at 13, because now he's held responsible, when he sees a task, he say, oh, I cannot touch myself and I cannot touch another girl or a girl. I can't because I see this first. Then I see me. Then I see the girl because the hormones and all that kind of stuff. We all been there. Huh? God is pretty smart, isn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> see that word marriage? This is a covenant leading to another covenant of marriage. Everything's holy. Along with the primary purpose of the tzitzit, based on the Pentateuch, there's another meaning. In ancient times, tassels were part of the hem of the garment, and the hem symbolized the wearer's authority. When David spared Saul, or Sewell, his life in the uh, cave of En Gedi, he cut off the corner of Saul's robe, symbolically demonstrating that the king's authority would be cut off. This is seen in 1 Samuel 24, 20. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Castles added to the hem were not worn by commoners, but by the nobility and the royalty. While scarlet or red is the color of shed blood, blue is the color of the bloodline, the mark of royalty. The scripture we just, we just read tells us that the blue thread is given to the fringe and must be twisted or knotted. Most English translations use the word attached, but or, uh, a put or secured. The Hebraic word is natan, na. Nun, ta, final nun, natan, meaning to give. Oh boy, oh boy, what do we see there in that word natan? We have the nun, right? The nun, do I see a nun there? Mm -hmm. Nun says life, right? Mm -hmm. What is the ta? It represents cross. So through our life, through the cross, the final nun means life again. So that means that we have life through the cross to give life to somebody else. Natan, give. Didn't you sure come to give? The Messiah is given by the Father to fulfill the commandments. Whoa. You've got to concentrate on that when you go home. 
He is the only one who ever performed them perfectly. He is able, his ability to fulfill the commandments proves he has the rightful bloodline to be, in, uh, be the eternal king. Hence, the blue thread signifies servant king. Remember in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation that the, uh, John the Revelator is looking and there was nobody could, that could take the scroll and everybody, and he starts crying because nobody was, had the authority to take the scroll. Then the Henry Yeshua reaches out, grabs the scroll because he was holy. Why? Because he fulfilled all of the commandments. He had the, and that was the title deed to earth, by the way, but that's another story. Blue was also used in settings where God's kingship was proclaimed. Blue was the cover, uh, was to cover the ark and other tabernacle uh, articles whenever they were moved and blue was also used with the curtains of the Mishkan or tabernacle where God dwelt enthroned between the cherubim. Shemot Exodus says 20, uh, 26 uh, 31 and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen it shall be uh, it shall be uh, made with cherubim the work of skillful workmen. And you shall make a screen for the doorway of the tent blue. Oh, oh doorway. Who's the door? It's door. We go through the door. Okay. Door. We just found out something about blue and purple, what, that, what it meant. Blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twisted linen, uh, linen, the work of a weaver. There's so much stuff in that that you're going to have to take that home and digest it. And when you find out, when it finally, when the rainbow word hits you, you're going to jump up and down. You're going to feel so much more complete in God because you're understanding what this is. And you're going to run out, you're going to buy yourself a me. There's no doubt. If you don't, these lessons were for naught. Because these lessons are supposed to drive you, direct you to the king. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Sometimes um, the, the list of, I feel like I want to wear this away because I know all what it represents. But then I feel like people um, maybe do not make it look right. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, you'll stand out like, a, oh, like your hair was undone. People will look at you like you only wear one shoe. That's why you wear it. To set yourself aside. You are proud to wear. See, that's where Satan will get people. I'm glad you brought that up. One more thing. Yes. Um, the pastor one time said that one person that is a Jewish person, he said that it will be better for us to not use it because we're not Jewish. That's, 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 that's not correct. That's not correct. You do not have to be Jewish to wear a tallit. I know because we are in inherited into the That's right. tree. So yeah. we are part of God. We so, believe of God. But so, so in other words, it makes you feel like, okay, should I or not? Don't ever take the Old Testament into church. Just take the Brit out of shop. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not meaning that literally. But you see the, the point? If you have a tallit, you're not, on our previous lessons that, that, that you missed, mm -hmm. you don't wear it to show off. I know. You wear because no, you I know, but I'm saying this for, for yeah. every, you wear it because God, because you feel that you want to wear it because of what you know about the tallit. Mm -hmm. And people will come up to you and say, how come you're wearing that thing? Isn't that an open door to Christ? Mm-hmm. And then you can explain all what it represents, and then we'll know it. That's right. Yeah. The violent take it by force. That does not mean hitting and all that and going to war. The violent in the heavenlies. You got overcome, and that's one of the deceptions of the enemy. He does not want you displaying God. Okay? Because yeah, I want a part of me, I want to do everything. No, I no, I understand. But the other one is that what they're going to say, you know, what they already say when I say that I'm away, you know, <laughs> oh my goodness. But isn't, isn't that the part where the fish 
goes upstream instead of with the rest of the fishies. Yep. Right? Be bold. Whoever, whenever that comes up, if, if you're impressed to, to wear it, because if you're wearing it for show, mm -hmm. don't even take it out. Thanks for bringing that up. <clears throat> There's another significance of the tzitzit. They stand for the priesthood and holiness. The the uh, high priest, what is this? What is this? Gadol? What is this? Hakani? High priest garment had a blue thread and again a reminder of the color symbolism. Shemot 2837. And you shall fasten it on a blue cord and it shall be on the turban it shall be at the front of the turban the tzitzit were used to remind to remind Israel of Elohim and his commandments commandments mitzvot just as Israel had priests who meditated between Elohim God and the people, the people as a whole were to be a kingdom of priests to meditate between Elohim and the nations. The continuation of this role, however, depended on Israel's obedience to Elohim, her king, Melech. Therefore, the tzitzit reminded the Israelites of who they were, who God was, and what he required of them. I would like to take a side note for a second and let us separate the first three word, uh, letters of the word Yisrael, which is what? Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And find the meaning, then add the last two letters of this word and see what we come up with. Are we ready to take a ride? <laughs> the first three letters, which are Yud, Sheen, Resh. Is the word yashar, which is a word for straight. The last two letters are aleph and the lamed, which of course spells God, L, right? Mm -hmm. So God is the straight deal. Israel are his am people. You see the I that represents the I and the final mem sofit I mem sofit represents the water of his word you see that sees the water of his word people people see the water of his word that's why God made the people to get back to him Everything we do, it seems like everything we do in Hebrew connects in one or many ways to each other, glorifying our Father. The blue thread is one out of eight strands on the tzitzi. The seven white strands signify perfection, purity, holiness of God's law. In one sense, a blue thread strand, Mashiach, is like an eight law with eight being the number of new beginnings, right? It shows that when the Messiah was revealed, he began a new law. Remember that? I give to you a new commandment. Hmm. Got it? He began a new law, not destroying the seven strands representing Torah, but beautifying them even further and adding his power to them. It's the blue representing the power, the healing power that the woman came and touched the hem of his garment. We know the story. The new law was actually a Torah of ability through him. This is gonna get better and better. Stay awake. Everybody awake? We know this law to be him, the living Torah. 
the Torah of love set in our hearts by the Ruach or the Spirit of God. The seven white strands are not taken away by the one blue, but rather they are completed by the red, uh, by the blue thread because it is wrapped around the seven to pull it all together with his power and with his authority. To lay as much is a very much type of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who brings to us and reveals to us the Word of God, both the written Word, which is Torah, and the living or Devar <coughs> Word, which is Yeshua. <coughs> that is why a cloak or a shawl is not a true Talit, not a holy symbol of the Spirit of God unless the tzitzit with the blue thread is attached. Considering the exorbitant cost of tekelit Dai, we studied that last week, I think, why would Elohim require every Jewish male to display a, a thread of this blue in each kanaf or corner of his mantle or the tallit? Considering the difficulty and the cost of constructing fringes and attaching them to the outer garment, why would Elohim consider it important for his people to make such a display? The tzitzit is certainly not essential to the structural integrity of the garment and are of no material benefit. For the Jewish man, Ish, the blue thread in the tzitzit, as I've already previously stated, was and is a reminder of Elohim himself. There is a Rabbi Mir who spoke about the tali, of the tekelet thread in the tzitzit of the tali. Why was the color blue chosen from all the other colors? Because the blue represents the sea, the sea represents the sky, the sky represents the throne of glory. I believe I have already shown you that in earlier parts of this lesson I've shown you that. Elohim, God's throne is described biblically as like sapphire stone and as a sky itself for clearness. And I, I think I covered that last week. Exodus and they, uh, Exodus 24, 10, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Very often in Jewish history and practice, Elohim, God himself, is referred to by the euphemism, uh, the, uh, euphemism heaven. So as not to say God in any way that might show disrespect for his holiness, this was the case in the ministry of Yeshua as reported in the Gospel of Matthew where the term kingdom of heaven is used instead of the kingdom of God as in other Gospels. When a Jewish man in biblical times looked at the tzitzit in the corners of his uh, mantle, he saw a blue thread that reminded him of heaven and the sapphire throne of Elohim. Remember at the first part of these lessons, I told you that I would be repeating myself on some uh, on occasion, and this is one of those times. The thread or the tekeli was to be exactly the same color of the high priest's robe, which was all of blue. <clears throat> Exodus 28, 31, and you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. The other elements of the high priest's uh, garments were decorated with tekeli as well as with gold, purple, scarlet, and crimson, or crimson. The official uniform, then, in which the high priest approached the service of the tabernacle as all of tekeli, which various, uh, with various other accents. This fact is very important when one considers its implication when applied to each Jewish man's tekeli. All of Israel is enjoined to become a nation of priests. 
wrote Jacob Milton, a historian since ancient times. Tickley was the outward sign of nobility and of priesthood. Uh, that might also fit into your your question, Mirabelle. Would you wear that? Because you are a priest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, requiring the Jews to wear this blue woolen cord as a sign that Israel, uh, he had combined nobility with priesthood so that Israel was not to rule man, but to serve God. As I've already stated, it technically in the tzitzit was not restricted to kings, priests, sages, or rabbis. It was a uniform of all Israel. And Mr. Radolf Brosh, another historian, has made this observation recorded, uh, regarding the, the tzitzit as Israel's uniform. The, Jewish, the Jews' battle is not that of bloodshed. He serves the king of kings. His fight is more difficult since he strives not for the tangible conquest, but for the values of the spirit. To identify himself as Elohim's soldier and to make himself recognizable as such to the world, he dons his uniform, the talit. Its whiteness symbolizes the purity of his mission. Wow. Huh? So if you have a talit and you are of the right spirit, you put that talit on and you work, you walk boldly into the congregation with all of the humility that this represents. You're literally saying to people, this is my God. No matter what you think. Because most of the churches, you're walking in to Satan's den. Mm -hmm. Most of the churches you're walking into is Satan's den. How can I say that? Because God's word is not preached. It's preached to man to extrapolate what man has to give back to the church in the form of anything other than holiness. In our churches today, we should have people crying and begging for forgiveness, running to the altar with repentance in their hearts, tears shedding on the floor of the of the Bema, saying, I am sorry, O oh Lord, for what I've done. I have grievously sinned against you. But that doesn't happen. You walk in with your coffee, you know, whatever you have, you may have a donut or two, bring it into the sanctuary. Singing is going on, the women showing the cleavage, short dresses. You're drinking your whatever, eating your whatever. Yeah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Man, she looks good. Man, he looks good. Wow. Message comes out that is so dry. You've heard it many times before. Never did anything to you or for you. You walked into church the same way you're going to walk out. Yeah. Dinner and a doornail. No power. No power. Because people are afraid to step in to the presence of God. Why? Because of what Maribel said, people are going to see. We need to be bold as we're Christians. Because that's what's in our heart. We don't live for man. That's a cliche. We don't live, yeah, everybody knows that. But do we do that? Why? Because man suppresses us. Because we think highly of man than we do of God. We'd rather serve man than serve God. Well, we've got to be ran backwards. This brings us back to reality. <laughs> huh? That's what this is for. Perhaps another reason that Elohim made this requirement was to emphasize the fact that every man in Israel, as the head of the 
of the uh, uh, Mishpacha family had the responsibility of being a, oh, 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 wait a minute, respond, oh, let's see, family, respond, uh, mm -hmm. priest, okay, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. And that was not happening. Huh? And that was what was not happening. That's, not, that's exactly right. Satan will try to destroy the family so that the church will be destroyed so that the lack of God's interaction with man is destroyed. Mm -hmm. Because you see, God's not going to be knocking on our doorstep. I think Yeshua says, I knock on the door, and if you open it, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to sup with you. You know the significance of the 13 years, boys? Uh-huh. Uh, it is a very significant connection to basically some of the commands that, that God was in, in his commandments about avoid sex, uh -huh. uh, and you know what? When, when you look back to see Jesus go through what he did in perfection, because all of us young boys went through that stuff at 13. Uh, uh, sure. I was 12. But the, okay. the, 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 essence, <laughs> the essence is the, the power, the perfection of Jesus Christ walking on here. And, and I mean, I can imagine some of the women that approached him, including the sisters. But anyway, um, that perfection uh, brought some light to me today about who is the Holy One. For him to walk down here for all those years and then fall for Satan pushing. Because Satan pushes a little young boy. Sure, absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. How old was Yeshua when he was in the temple? Twelve, and right? mommy and daddy went looking for him? Twelve, right? Huh? Was it 12? 12 years old. Just short of being bar mitzvah. Is there something to that? In other words, he had reached his adulthood prior to the time he was supposed to reach his adulthood to get your to leave. Because hmm. at 13, he was bar mitzvah. You can be assured of that. He was way ahead. Where the scribes and, and said, where did he get all this authority and knowledge? He was the son of God. Our Messiah. So anyway. Responsibility of being a priest in the home. He was to lead his family in worship uh, and, and a priestly act of extending God's providential uh, uh, blessings upon both his wife, Isha, and his children, Yaladim. The same blessings that Elohim instructed Aaron to place upon all the Yaladim of Israel, children of Israel. We see this in Numbers 624 and so on. Bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. When any Jew saw the blue thread of his tzitzit, he was immediately reminded that he was part of that kingdom of priests that Elohim had uniquely called unto himself. We can look at Exodus 19, 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder, lightnings, flashings, and thick cloud upon the mountain and the very loud trumpet sound, the shofar, so that all the people were in the camp trembled. The Israelites were commanded to place a blue thread on the tzitzit of their tallit because they understood themselves to be noble sons of the king of the universe, always pursuing his mitzvot or commandments and understanding that remains to this day. Yom, day, yom, day. The second reason for this tekelit in the tzitzit was so that ye may look upon it and remember all the mitzvot or commandments of Adonai, Lord, and do them both with the tzitzit and the tekelit are physical reminders of all the commandments of Elohim encouraging Jews to do them. This passage that requires a placement of the tzitzit 
and the Tekelit and the garments of the Jews is a part of the Shema prayer complex that is recited twice daily by observant Jews. Therefore, it is a constant reminder of the commandments. This call to remembrance and observance of all the com God's commandments is manifest in the tzitzit of the Talit. On three different levels. First, the Shema, the greatest commandment. The second with the de a Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And the finality with the sum total of all the commandments, the 613 mitzvot. Are all the 16, 613 commandments, are some of them man-made? Every one of the 613 are in the Torah. I've got a book coming that's going to show, show that, where each, each scripture of the 60, 613 commandments are in there. Let's discuss some things about the children and blessings and the weddings once again. Remember I told you in advance I would be revisiting only with additional information? Well, here's another instance. It is traditional for the Barakot blessing in, in Judaism to be performed under the Talit. The benedictions are Torah and the uh, Barakot, the, uh, Barakot uh, blessings. Therefore, the Talit is a reminder that the power of God, God's word, Devar, blesses his Am people among these are the Berkot blessings of Yeladim children and the wedding ceremony. When younger children receive the Berkot blessings of Yaakov, Jacob, and the Aaronic benediction, they often stand under the Talit. That is a traditional after that is traditional after the Shabbat meal, Shabbat. For the Jewish father to bless his children with the words of Elohim, recorded in in, uh, in Bereshit 48, 20, and says, And he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel shall pronounce blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Yeshua, uh, uh, um, uh, Yeshua, 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 Yahoo. It's always hard saying that. Why, why could they just say Isaiah? <laughs> and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. We need to pray that every day for ourselves. The Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of the knowledge, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Father places his right hand on the head of each of his yellow dean, children, and prays the following. Barakah, blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. This is for the sons, Rachel and Leah for the daughters. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. At this point, the father may add a personal barakah blessing for his son or daughter. Then he continues the prayer. May the Spirit of the Lord rest upon you, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, spirit of power and, and knowledge and, and, and the fear of the Lord. And may you delight in the fear of God. Now, you know the fear of God does not mean scared. It's worship. Performing this very call blessing under the Talit reinforces for yellow deep children the thing that uh, Elohim protects his um, people through the mitzvot, commandments of the Torah, and through his provisions to bless the descendants of Israel. Always Barakah blessing is, in effect, a covering and enshrouding of the one blessed in the providence of God. What better way to demonstrate this truth for yellow deep children than by pronouncing God's Barakah blessing upon them under the covering of the Talit. You know that when a Jewish wedding takes place, the ceremony is generally performed under a chuppah, or a canopy, which is often comprised of the Talit, held up by four men. Remember four? Four corners of the altar? 
especially in the Sephardic tradition. Remember, we covered this in our intro. I think we could look at a possible reason for the wedding being held under the pupa or the tallit. Let's look at what happened at Sinai when Yisrael was espoused in marriage to Elohim. The record de uh, declares that the Kodesh, Har, Har's mountain, Hode, uh, the uh, holy mountain, holy mountain was enshrouded in clouds and smoke from the presence of the Almighty. And the account is that in Exodus or Shemot, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, we're at number three, morning that, that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, very, very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled as everybody was shaking in their bones. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain now the Mount, uh, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Man, could I preach on that. It's, it's smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Oh, there's so much stuff in there. Woo, hallelujah. I don't know, man. Maybe I took a vitamin this morning. <laughs> this is awesome to me. Israel had been summoned from Egypt, remember we talked about Egypt being pulled out of Egypt? Yeah. By the call or voice of God, Elohim, to appear before his har, that's a uh, 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 mountain, and receive the covenant of marriage that joined them in relationship with their God. And indeed the cloud and ash fire uh, of his presence had accompanied them from the time of their exodus from Ramses until they came to Sinai. This covering with clouds as a symbol of divine protection can easily be seen in the expectation of God's covering present, uh, presence in both marriage and in the verha, the blessings of the yellow D and the children that he has ordained in his word. You cannot get out of being unless you have God's word. God's word's got the authority. I think this principle may also be seen in divorce. Uh oh, that painful process which sunders marriage. Divorce can be described as a, rend a rending of the covering garment of vercha, blessing, upon a sanctified or set apart union. It may well be seen as a severing of the sit seats of the kupas tali. Removing the Barakah blessings of God's Torah upon the marriage and rendering it invalid. If at all possible, those of you that are fighting in your marriage, I'm going to say to you, you continue to fight in the heavenlies and bind up the, dece the deceiver that is trying to sever the covenant that you have made. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, God hates divorce. Just as ripping the tzitzit from one's tali in biblical times represented a severing of authority, so a marriage is void. It's very called blessing severed through divorce because God hates divorce. This is the reason for Jesus' injunction that man should not separate what God has joined together under his blessing. Both in symbolism of Barakah, blessings upon the constitution of marriage as being covered by the Talit, and in the rendering of blessings stayed in divorce. One can see the importance of the protection, uh, the protecting and maintenance of the, the covering of the Barakah, the blessing. The enshrouding of God's provision for health, well-being in marriage. Whatever is done in Barakah blessing through the provision of God's or Devar's word is an overshadowing of the wings of the Almighty, the covering of the divine presence that brings healing and security. This ends the 
give a lesson on the Talit, just as my batteries have run out of my pointer. <laughs> John, before you go to that, oh, I'm sorry. Next week will be our last lesson, and don't miss it. Yes, cousin. The concept of Catholic priests not being married, uh, and all of the most, or many of the nuns turning up pregnant, <laughs> um, that is a confusion. Yes, it is. You know, and, and I was thinking about that. It, you know, you, you have to be perfect like Jesus, and don't touch anyone, don't get married. And God is telling you, marriage is the blessing that I've put man and woman here to receive. So the Catholic Church is, I mean, they're trying to change that now, but I, I could, that confused me for years. I said, what are y'all thinking about? <laughs> Poor man. <clears throat> Cousin. Yes. Aspire to inspire before you expire, and take what you need and give the rest away. Amen. Wanda, you got an hour and a half. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Reverend Baudry, for that wonderful teaching, and thank you all for tuning in today. We know that this lesson was very intense, and if you remember in the beginning, uh, Reverend John uh, advised that we take this lesson and just take it apart real slow, digest it, dissect it, and just take it one line at a time to really get all of the benefits out of it. Now, the lessons are available on our website at www.freehebrewclass.com. We have a page specific for the Talit lessons, so you can find everything that we have covered up till today. Even these lessons today are on our website. Again, that's www.freehebrewclass.com. Uh, as Reverend John Gaudry mentioned, this is uh, the climactic phase of our lessons for the entire year. We have one more lesson left, and then we're going to be in prayer, uh, waiting in uh, hopeful and lively expectation for the Lord to tell us what we're doing next. So during the summer, we're going to be out, and we would encourage you to just go through all of the lessons to just really build your strength in the Word of God. Uh, until we see you next week, Shabbat Shalom. We pray that you are able to get into the studies this week and enjoy your Sabbath and happy Memorial Day. Here we stand with our city of running blessing. You saw on an eye for now, but like a, they seem like a shalom. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord shine his face to you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you <coughs> and give to you his peace. <coughs> Through our shalom, the Prince of Peace, for he is and always will be our Messiah, our Redeemer, our Healer, our Banner, our Sitaner, our Provider. Lord, you sure we make you everything. We accept we invite you into our hearts, those of us who do not know you, for we worship you, and we thank you for all of the provisions, and help us to give back what you expect from us. Give us a clarity of mind to do your will, O oh Lord. Remove the stones and the obstacles in our path so that we may serve you with all of our hearts, with all of our spirit that is within us. 
Allow us to fulfill the desires that you have placed into us, Father. Through your Son, Yeshua. Amen.